Uh, man, I've been looking forward to this series uh, for, for a long time. Uh, put it down on paper, uh, maybe a year ago even, looking forward to thinking, I think, what better time to talk about the supernatural than like October? I mean, already you had flipped through the channels and all the monster movies and all are on, the horror movies, the demonic movies and all that stuff. And I thought, you know, it's probably good to have some, some balance. Uh, and and what, is, what does the Bible actually say? If, if all we get about this stuff is from Hollywood, we're going to be all messed up um, with any topic, but especially this one. I mean, this, this, is, this is like the God's topic. I mean, this, this is his realm. Uh, it was just, I mean, it's just crazy how much this stuff comes up. I, it was a, a little over a week ago, sometime uh, last week, be, before last Sunday, uh, Cheryl and I were having supper or dinner, lunch, whatever, with, with a couple friends, and, and the husband says, hey, we've got this ghost in our house. And I'm like, huh. <laughs> So tell me more. <laughs> you know, I'd like to know about this. Uh, for one thing, uh, okay, right? And for another thing, I was like, hey, it, conveniently, we have a, a sermon series coming up in about a week. I can use your stuff. Uh, and, but then he goes on to say about some things that have been happening in, in their house. Uh, and it's been happening for a while. And they've told us this before, but I kinda, you, know, you kind of forget. Then you're like, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Like doors will open and close uh, uh, when no one's home. Like they'll hear doors slamming. Um, they, uh, um, things will move uh, that, that like they'll c- come downstairs and something that was on a top shelf in some place that no one could reach is suddenly on the middle of the floor in a different room and they're like, well, that's weird. Um, they, they, they've said they can feel this presence once in a while. Um, they said he's friendly, they, you know, that, that, that n- never causes trouble. And of course, all these uh, red flags are going up in my mind, and, 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 I, and I tell them, I said, this is, this is not a ghost, all right? Uh, we'll talk about ghosts in like three weeks, so, so, but, but just to spoil the, the surprise, there's no such thing as ghosts, right? They don't, the, the, at least not the way we think of a ghost, like, oh, Uncle Herbert died, and, and it was a, a bad thing, and he's coming back to haunt someone, you know, until he finds peace, like the movies would say. The, that's not real. Okay, we'll talk about that scripturally and in detail later. Um, but but uh, <laughs> there are, maybe it's just a, a, an argument of vocabulary, uh, because there are spiritual entities that intersect with, 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 with our world, um, uh, that, that, that uh, coexist in this world that they we live in. Uh, sometimes uh, they make themselves known to us in some way or another. Sometimes they, they don't. Uh, and, and it was a great conversation. I had their friends. I gave them a list of things to do. Um, and and we'll, actually, I'll, we'll cover some of that today. Uh, of of uh, What do you do <laughs> if that's happening in, in, in your, your house? Um, talking about our everyday lives the same verse that john read earlier it's interesting how he even said how god kind of intersects things we didn't like talk hey here's the scripture we're going to start at but but this is paul talking about just our everyday life not not like hey there's a big storm coming but this is how you face monday right this he says we do not wrestle against flesh and blood but against the rulers against authorities against the cosmic powers over this present darkness against what what's the word spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. There are spiritual beings in existence that co-inhabit this space that that we're in. Paul is acknowledging the spiritual world. The Bible describes both good and evil beings uh, throughout, throughout Scripture in multiple places that are at war with one another. Most of those battles tend to center around us and our souls, and, and whether the destruction or salvation of us. But, and we generally don't see any of those battles uh, that are taking place. I mean, I've never seen it, well, very little uh, of that kind of activity. So I don't, I don't know, you know what, what spiritual things are happening, even right now, you know, as, as we're in this room. Who knows? We just, is they exist, but we don't know. Uh, where they're at, or what they even necessarily look like. Here's, here's what we're going to do the next four weeks. Uh, today, uh, as a general introduction to angels and demons. Well, what are they? Who are they? In, in, a, in a almost a uh, Sunday school lesson style as opposed to sermon type style. And then we'll break this down in the next three weeks. Uh, next week, week two, how God works in the world, which will include some of the information we talked today about angels. Uh, week three, how Satan works in the world, which will include some of the conversation that we'll have today about demons. And then week four, what happens when people die? Where does my soul go when I die? Do I haunt people? I mean, that'd be kind of fun if I could, but that's not how it works. 
Um, and we'll talk about where do you go, uh, what happens to you, are you asleep? You know, there's all kinds of theories out there and, and ideas that are thrown around out there. Uh, do these uh, spirits even exist uh, as far as like Uncle Henry? Does he still float around out there? We'll talk about that. Now, full disclosure, uh, the inspiration of this series came from this book, Core uh, 52, uh, which I've told you before, I have like an eight-year plan to actually go through the basic doctrines of, uh, it, that are presented in this book. This was like one little chapter, and, and uh, when, as I was reading it a year and a half ago, I thought, man, I've got to make a whole series out of this, because it was just you know a couple, three pages. But it's full of content, great stuff, and a lot of the outline material uh, that you'll see, the printed stuff you'll see on the screen, really comes right out of here, um, and I want to give uh, Mark more credit for that. This is uh, it's supposed to be, a, it's intended to be a 15-minute daily guide uh, for a, uh, like a devotion type thing. If uh, you're interested in that type of thing, look this up. Uh, uh, Core 52, it's a great book uh, to go through, so I wanted to give him that. We don't have them, we're not selling them, I don't get any commission, but uh, just, just you know, it's a good stuff. All right, angels, angels, let's talk about them today. They're mentioned more than 170 times in the New Testament alone. Think about that. That's a lot of mentions. I mean, that's like a major amount of information that is given on angels just in the New Testament. I mean, you think about some of the main characters of the New Testament, you think about Stephen, you know, the first martyr. Uh, he's mentioned like a couple times. <laughs> you know, you get the story of his death, you get the little story earlier. Uh, there's not a lot about him, so he comes up a couple, three times. Ethiopian eunuch, major story in Acts 8, is mentioned once, <laughs> you know. Uh, the, the apostles themselves, uh, the original 12 disciples, you hear them, about them in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Some of them are mentioned in Acts, but not all of them. And then you got Peter writes a letter. I mean, after that, it's just kind of like, they just kind of disappeared. You know, they're happening. You hear, read stuff in church history. But, but angels, they're 170 times just in the New Testament. A lot of it's in the Gospels. A lot of it's in Revelation. And they're referred to, like Paul just, uh, we just read the verse in, in Ephesians, in, in the rest of the Scripture. Uh, but that's a major story in, in, about angels in Scripture in the New Testament. Angels have uh, three primary functions. And again, this comes from Mark, Mark Moore, his, his outline, but I, I liked it, so why reinvent the wheel? Uh, messengers of God is, is the first one. And, and the actual Greek word, when the, the translators sit down to write our English Bibles, the actual Greek word is angelos, which sounds a lot like angel, right? That means they transliterated it. They just took the Greek letter and, and gave it the English uh, equivalent. Angel, angelos, angel. Uh, the, the interpretation, the actual meaning of that word means messenger. So angels are messengers. So sometimes the word angelos is not written down as angel, it's written down as messenger. The Apostle Paul says, I am an angelos of the gospel, I'm a messenger of the gospel. So there's a preacher who's a messenger of the gospel, and then there's times that there are spiritual beings. The interpreters have to look at the context and say, what's going on here? No, is this an angelic being or is this like a person who is a messenger? Angels are all over the story of the birth of Jesus. An angel comes and brings a message to, to Zechariah and tells him he's going to have a child, John the Baptist. An angel comes and brings a message to Mary saying, hey, you're going to have a child. He's going to be a savior. He's going to, be the, he's going to rule the world. An angel brings a message to Joseph in a dream, but it's still an angel that shows up in his dream and his subconscious and speaks to him and communicates him a message from God. Angels show up and bring a message to shepherds who are just hanging out doing their job one night that a Savior has been born. That is their primary purpose, uh, one of them anyway, in, in Scripture, letting people know a message. God says, hey, I've got this message. Go ahead and send that to someone. We see angels talking to Daniel and, and other Old Testament characters too. Uh, so it happens throughout world history, uh, angels bringing messages uh, to people. Revelations, uh, in Revelation chapter 2 and, and 3, Jesus writes a series of seven letters, each one each to seven different churches in Asia Minor. And he says, uh, uh, each, he starts each letter to the angel of the church at Ephesus, or Smyrna or Pergamon and so forth, to, to the messenger. So there's some debate, are they talking to the preacher, like Paul, I'm, I'm a messenger of the gospel, or are they talking to an angel that has been assigned to each church? Uh, I, actually, I'm good either way, uh, maybe even both. I think it'd be kind of cool to think, wow, there's an angel who like 
watches over what's going on here and it protects and it's like they're in charge of, hey, what's going on at the pathway? They report what's going on at the pathway. I, I don't know. I don't know. We don't really know about that. And, and this is an interesting conversation about the role of angels in, in um in, in the local church. I, I really don't know, but I'm good with either. Uh, the next primary function of angels is probably the most practical one. This is the time, if you've ever seen one or wondered if you've seen one, it's probably in this category that they minister, angels, they minister to Jesus and his people. In Mark 1, it talks about the, the role of angels ministering to Jesus. Uh, he was in the wilderness 40 days, being tempted by Satan. He was with wild animals, and the angels were ministering to him. We don't know what that means uh, exactly. Uh, what does that look like? I don't know. It gives us a clue. There's wild animals. Maybe they were protecting Jesus from wild animals in that 40 days. He was fasting the whole time. Uh, he was praying. Uh, he was you know, really getting ready to ramp up ministry and things. Uh, maybe they were protecting them from spiritual beings, maybe from animals, maybe they were, uh, we know other places in scripture, angels came in and encouraged him, and we're not even sure what that means exactly, but there was an interaction between Jesus and, and angels. Now, him being the son of God, he would have seen them when we don't. He has, a, he see things we couldn't see. He saw demons in people, you know, he, he saw things that, that normal people didn't see. So he probably could actually correspond and have conversations with the angels. He'd known them uh, since he created them uh, sometime earlier. Uh, they also minister to us. Psalm 9111, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. Huh. You ever hear the term guardian angel? People say, oh, I don't know. Well, you'll uh, command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. Psalm 34, 7, the angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him, and he delivers them. Anybody ever, do you fear God? Do you fear God? And that's not scared, but do you like a healthy respect? God says, I'm going to surround you with angels. I'll, I'll protect you. I'll watch over you. It's part of their duty. They bring messages. They also minister to us. We don't think about that much, maybe. Um, uh, we don't maybe have that in the forefront uh, of our mind because we don't really know even what that means. Most, mostly we've never seen it. Uh, we've probably experienced it, but didn't even really know we experienced it. Uh, but I believe uh, firmly angels are involved in the lives of believers, just as demons are involved in the lives of unbelievers. The spiritual realm is working with those who uh, are with, with them. Whether we see them or sense them or not, they, they are there. It is not uncommon for me in my prayer life to pray for God to send angels to watch over people. Um, it's not like the first prayer usually, but sometimes if I'm praying for someone regularly, at some point I'll be like, hey God, uh, uh, I, I don't even, I'll even, you know, just have the conversation. That's what I love about prayer. It's a conversation with God. I'll be like, I don't, I don't know the theology of this thoroughly, but, but God, if this is how this works, I just ask you dispatch angels and protect so-and-so. You know, I'll let you decide what that means, you know, I'll, in my conversation with him. And, and I believe he does. I, be, I believe he dispatch, dispatches uh, angels. When I move into a new house, uh, one of the first things I do is I pray for angels to, to surround the house, to be posted at strategic locations, to watch over my family uh, and my home. Uh, when we moved into this building, uh, part of my prayer was to dispatch angels and, and to watch, be on watch in, in this building. Will we ever see it? I don't know. I mean, I don't know. I never have but that doesn't mean it's not happening. When my children were born, I prayed for angels or an angel. I prayed for God to protect them, to surround them. There's multiple times when they were going into situations I knew might be um, uh, frightening for them or whatever, intimidating just for angels to be with them, to protect them, to su surround them. Uh, when uh, my daughter Danielle and Thad <clears throat> got married and they found a home, I prayed for angels to be posted in key locations, and until this, um, and they'll find out today, uh, for angels to be posted in key locations around their home. When my daughter Shanna and Alan got married and they found a home, I prayed for angels to be posted in key locations of, of uh, their homes. Uh, I'm two to four weeks from becoming a grandfather uh, for the first time, which I'm really excited about. And you know what? One of the, first, what, one of the things I'm, I can't wait to have happen is for me to have some alone time with little baby Weller and, and, and offer that child in prayer, I just one-on-one, -on -one, just personally, me and God, and just say, God, would you surround this child, you know, guide this child uh, in his life and, and, and dispatch angels as needed. That'll just be one of my prayers. I, 
Again, I don't even know how that works. I don't even know how that prayer has been answered. But I've seen the scripture that says God does send angels to minister to his people. And so I just entrust, let God, he, he's, he's, he knows what's going on, and I don't. And, and this is important to note. Uh, we're not praying to angels. We're praying to God who sends angels. He's the one in control. He's the authority. Let him decide. As he's way smart. He knows what's going on, and I don't. I, I can guess. I've seen movies that probably warps my, my you know, true understanding. Um, so I just pray, God, uh, just, just you do what you do, but we're asking angels to be involved, and, and it happens. Here's a third thing that uh, Mark Moore uh, mentions. Uh, it was a little weaker than the first two, but I've got to mention it because I'm stealing his outline. It validates God's men by mere association. He says, uh, Mark does, if you stand an angel next to a guy, he suddenly wears a white hat. Like, oh, he must be a good guy. He's with an angel, right? Uh, so Moses in Acts 7, it says an angel appeared to Moses, giving him a, a credibility. And Acts 10 talks about an angel appearing to Cornelius, the first Gentile believer, basically giving credibility to the fact that Gentiles can become people of faith. Uh, Luke 15 says the angels rejoice in heaven when, whenever a sinner re, re, repents. Uh, we don't see that. We don't hear that. But I, I see that as a validation in the spiritual world where heaven celebrates in this war that's been going on. And God says this one's mine and the angel's like yes and they're, he's on our, they're on our side now and, and it's like a celebration that goes on when a sinner uh, repents which is any of us who repents at some point in your life if you became a believer in Christ uh, there was a heavenly celebration for you uh, that, that you never got to see but uh, it happened it happened we know scripture says that it did now we'll look at more angels next week and 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 uh, how they really interact and and how god uses them because that's how many times god interacts in the world uh, is through his angels setting up situations and, and doing things uh, just for now uh, the good point uh, to have going forward in this series they exist they're they're real they're servants of god they're the good guys uh, they interact with us and in the world when necessary now let's look at the other side of the battle is the demons again they are real they do exist uh, they confronted jesus uh, they were frightened of him because he is the authority. He is the son of the living God. They, they, they had no choice but to obey anything he said. I mean, they, they, they just had no choice because he, he, is, he is God. Uh, they possessed individuals in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. They still do today. They chose to follow Satan. They choose to follow him, uh, who also is a fallen angel. Uh, they are destructive. If you look at how they interact with people, they cause things like blindness, muteness, uh, seizures, mental illness. Uh, I'm convinced there's a mixture in our culture in the realm of mental illness. Some is legitimate physical stuff, and some of it is spiritual, and it's hard for a doctor to diagnose that. And I, I don't, you know, I'm, I, it's over my pay grade, too, at least at this stage uh, of my life, um, that there are some of the things that are being diagnosed physically are actually spiritual, I believe, uh, in, in nature. And, and it's our medications won't help that, which sometimes confuses and, and, and just doesn't help uh, the situation. Uh, they are, as uh, Ephesians text we read earlier implies, they are organized into a global force, and their goal is to destroy God's people and, and anything of his creation. So, what do we do with demons? Uh, we don't want them in our lives, right? We don't want them near us. Uh, if you hear the stories or read the scripture, you think, I don't want that going on. Well, there are four main ways they will get a foothold in a person's life. How do they attack the soul of a person? How does the dude in, in the scripture that's hanging out by the tombs, being demon-possessed, cutting himself, throwing himself in the fire, having seizures, how does that happen? What opened, why did he get demon-possessed and the other people didn't. Here are four uh, big open doors that will um, allow, doesn't mean necessarily they'll enter, but it opens a door to demon activity in your life. Number one is cult or occultic activity. Uh, whether it's just an outright cult that you just, just plain as, or a Satan worshiping type of, of, of uh, a group or organization that will open a door because the whole that's the whole purpose of it is they're like they're worshiping Satan, you know. Um, but but there's also uh, 
more hidden ways. Timothy 4.1 says, The Spirit expressly says in latter times, uh, some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits, teachings of demons. Um, that's, that's like incorrect doctrine, even in the name of Jesus. Uh, just because a, a sign says church on it doesn't mean it's really a church of Jesus Christ. You have to be really, really careful, uh, especially these days, because there's more and more churches not teaching strictly from, from the Word of God, but, but doctrines of, of demons, so to speak. That can just be a lot of things. Uh, so involvement in religious groups that deny the deity of Christ in some way, or worship Satan in some way, or worship his ways in some way, can open a door to demonic influence. Uh, number two, sexual activity outside of God's will. Um, man, this is where I think culture is going wild and they don't understand what they're doing. God has a plan for sexual expression. It's with a man and a wife in marriage forever. All right? that, that, that's the plan in Scripture. And I, things happen and stuff, I get that. But here's, here's the deal. Uh, there's something about the perversion of that plan that opens doors to satanic influence and activity in a person's life. And, and, and I've heard all kinds of stories where a demonic a possession or oppression will define that in a second, uh, can be traced back to a marital infidelity of some sort. Uh, if that is not taken care of, uh, uh, forgiven, covered by the blood of Jesus, and, and so if forgiven and so you can move on, if that's not taken care of, it could be an open door just sitting there waiting for demonic um, oppression uh, in, in your life. Number three, uh, drugs. That's an open door. Uh, we're born with this protective uh, spiritual veil. I mean, let's say we mostly we don't know this stuff goes on, but there are some drugs that kind of sound, I don't, I don't understand it, don't get it, but, but uh, it's just in so many sources I've read this, and, and it's in his, Mark's understanding too, uh, that hard drugs especially will just kind of erase that veil somehow. Um, and, and you'll start seeing things and hearing things and experiencing things that you wouldn't have had you not taken the drugs. It opens some type of, uh, of door to, to demonic influence. And then fourth, um, this will make me sound like an old fuddy-duddy, but it's really true. Music styles that honor the dark spiritual world. Uh, music that worships and glorifies satanic practices, uh, and, and many of the things we talked about uh, above, uh, which some of it might even sound kind of innocent, but some, especially the darker music. That, that um, There's some music that just tends to attract people that, that uh, are all you know, wearing black and dark, and you know, there's a subculture thing. There, there is an open door somewhere in there, that, that, that an influence that's happening in there that you have to be uh, careful. Now, again, important, this doesn't mean you automatically get demon-possessed because any of these things happen. Oh, no, I took drugs in 1972. Uh, you know, not necessarily, uh, it, but it means it is an open door that that could be where a, a demon could have access to a human being. And again, at the end, I'll tell you is how you close those doors because you've got, if that's, any of these have happened to you, you've got to close these doors. But I have heard tons of demonic possession stories over the years that started with drugs as an opening uh, to the door um, or a married person crossing a line sexually with someone that opened a door. Here are four levels of demonic influence. So you immediately think, oh, possession, you know, when the head spins around and, you know, pea soup and all this stuff. Uh, uh, that's, that can happen, but but let's that's, that's, that's start with the level one. Level one is temptation. Uh, every temptation, we're all tempted every day, every day. You know, sometimes it's just the evil within us, Scripture says. But but if you have participated in certain evil things, then then that does open that door, and demons are there, right there, to remind you of how awesome that was. Hey, remember that those drugs you took? You should take some more. Remember that thing you did? You should do that again. It's kind of whispering in your ear, a temptation uh, type of thing that they're always whispering in, in your ear. Uh, I have um, never taken drugs in my life. Uh, you know, not, not saying that to gloat, I'm just saying it just, it just never has. So it's never tempted me. Uh, there's never been that whisper saying, hey, remember? Back? Nope. <laughs> and, and partly because as a youngster and even a junior high or in high school, I thought, I just don't want that messing with me. And, and so that's, now I've done other things that, that, those demons could whisper in my ear, hey, remember when you did that? 
Wasn't that fun? Wasn't that exciting? Whatever. You had to do that again. So it's a, there's a temptation level. So that's kind of like an entry level uh, influence that de- uh, demons can have uh, in your life. Number two is oppression. This is a step beyond temptation. It's a physical or emotional uh, harm that they can cause uh, on you, uh, caused by some type of external attack. Um, Mark mentions like accidents that could happen. Maybe something happens and, and there's a, a cause it's an accident or sickness. Even death can happen um, through the, the oppression of demonic activity. The closer you are to demo- demonic activity, the more unexplained things can happen in a person's life that can lead to bad things. Like, a, like I said, a car can come out of nowhere and suddenly smack into you, a chronic sickness that won't go away. Could be demonic. It could be just oh, you happen to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. So you don't want to take this stuff so crazy that you're looking for a demon behind every bush. You know that, that gets, That's extreme. But sometimes it could be explained uh, that way. Uh, number three, influence. This is, uh, and I've seen this at work in, in people, a mental influence toward anger, depression, violence, uh, self-harm. Um, I think a lot of suicides that happen, there is demonic influence whispering in their ear, saying, just, just end it, just, just, just take your life, just, just, you know, just, you could stop it right here. Um, maybe it's medication that lowers the ability to filter those out. That veil has been lowered, or maybe it's just the constant pounding of voices that, that talks someone into harming themselves when they actually do it. I've talked to people after failed suicide attempts where they were completely convinced that if I take my life, everyone else will be happier. I'm doing it for them. Now, that's a lie. Where do you get that? Some of it could be demonic little voices saying, do this for your family, do this for your friends. And you hear that enough, you'll believe it, and it, uh, it, it, it is a demonic influence. Uh, fits of rage, violence, depression that seems impossible to crawl out of, uh, the desire to cut yourself and inflict pain. That goes back to, we, we talked about the prophets of Baal last week. Uh, there was demonic, they were doing that. They were cutting themselves as part of worship. Uh, so that's been going on a long time. Uh, none of that's from God, and it's all demonic in nature. And then the fourth one, the big one you think of, is the possession. Uh, the physical body being controlled in whole or in part by a demon or demons. Um, it could be their hands, it could be their voice, uh, it could be a superhuman strength. I've heard stories of people doing things like, I mean, the scripture gives us examples of people you know, breaking chains, uh, whole crowds can't control them, and uh, uh, it's because of demonic per, uh, possession. I have a good friend who grew up in a home. His mother was a witch doctor uh, in Africa, and, and his mom, his, his growing up experience with people would come to his mom to, to contact the dead, and, and, and these voices would come out of her that were of different languages that she'd never learned, different accents that she'd never heard. Uh, they were definitely something that was not her that was there. That was a demonic possession uh, going on in that situation. We had someone come to our prayer room a number of years ago. She was a single woman. Uh, she was sexually active. She was a drug user. Uh, she listened to a lot of dark music, basically all the open doors that I mentioned earlier. She told stories of a presence that would be in her home uh, regularly, like nightly. Uh, objects moved, music turned on and off by itself, doorknobs turned, doors opened. Uh, she would be sitting on the couch and she could literally, first she would feel a presence and she would literally see the couch indent like, as if someone had sat down next to her. As uh, she came to the prayer room, she was looking for help. We talked, we prayed, we read scripture. Uh, there were moments, there was about an hour and a half interaction, where she was terrified about something that we couldn't see. There was more than me there. Um, something was going on that we don't know. All we knew is we were going to sing and pray and talk about Jesus and read scripture. And, and, and after an hour and a half or so, uh, and part of the conversation was we asked her to repent of some of the sin going on in her life. She said, we, we can, you can leave this place pure and clean, forgiven by God today, right now. And, and, and we can get rid of this demon activity in your life if you want it. Uh, she was not willing to repent of her sin, uh, which means what good would it do to get rid of the demon? They'll just come back. There's, there, there's no protection when Jesus is not living in you. Uh, so she decided not to do that. Ultimately, uh, she couldn't handle the situation. She ran to the bathroom, vomited, ran out of the house, 
uh, so we were across the street, and, and we never saw her again, so I don't know whatever happened to her. Um, I don't want you to be freaked out today about what we're talking about, because we're talking about things we don't see, uh, that is unnatural, um, and especially if you've made a mistake in your life, you're thinking, well, I've done some of the stuff that opens doors. Uh, let me share you three ways to minimize uh, demonic activity in your life. Uh, because these are important. These are, these are critical for us to know as, as, as Christians. Um, in, in, in short, basically, a Jesus, or a demons don't like hanging around Jesus' people. They don't like hearing his name. They don't like Jesus' people. They don't like scripture, things like that. So three ways to minimize. Number one is scripture. Just read scripture. Uh, read it. Memorize it. Play it in your car. You know, have scripture around. Number two, worship music. There's... Just play worship music. Then doesn't have to be 24-7, but, but the more worship of Jesus that's in your life, the more they are not comfortable. And pray in Jesus' name. Uh, pray, 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 pray. And always mention Jesus. Uh, demons cannot handle the name or the presence of Jesus. At that name, every knee must bow, including them. Right? Uh, and, and so those are three simple ways. That's lifestyle stuff. Right? Uh, it doesn't mean, oh no, something's freaking me out. Quick, turn on a song. Keep Play, play music regularly. Make that a part of your life. Worship is not a Sunday morning event. It is a part of, of your life. And here's a bonus one, because it really refers to that gal I was talking about earlier. Repent of willing, rebellious sin. Um, that's usually the, the stronghold that's going on. I don't want to give up this, this part of my life. I, I, I want to uh, have whatever going on I have going on. Uh, and I don't want to stop it. Um, repent, turn around, go back to God. It doesn't mean you're perfect. It means turn around, get that sin taken care of, whatever sin it is. Uh, get it forgiven. That's why he God died on the cross. There's nothing you've done he can't forgive him and, and move forward. Jesus wins every single time. Here, here, here's, if, if you have had some of the issues we've talked about today, here's, here's what I told my friends last week to do. Um, and it's just a simple list. Start with repentance, what I just said. Make sure you're right with God. Renounce any activity in the past that you've done that may have opened the door. It might have been 20 years ago, 30 years ago. It doesn't matter. If, if you remember doing something, just say, Jesus, I renounce that. I'm so sorry. I've been forgiven. In the name of Jesus, I, I renounce that activity in my life. Cut that off. Cut that off so it's not a foothold anymore. Ask those sins to be covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. Maybe you already have. That's great. You already done it. That's good. That's wonderful. Uh, and then focus on the things on the list above. That will take care of like 99% of any activity going on in the demonic realm that we talked about today. All right, next week, we're going to look at how God works in the world, uh, his authority over uh, the entire spiritual world, his authority and dominion, right? We're going to look at how he hands out assignments and how they get done and how he moves in our lives on this uh, spiritual, uh, supernatural, excuse me, uh, series we're looking at. Let's pray.